a new computer model shows that breaking up is hard to do. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is KT Ramesh, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Director, Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute, Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, KT. Thank you. Nice to be here. So what does the Extreme Materials Institute do, and how are you involved in outer space research? Sure. So the Institute is a, a, a cross-divisional institute. So, you, you know, if you understand the way universities work, we have an engineering school, a school of sciences. Uh, in our case, we go between the engineering school, the school of arts and sciences, and the applied physics laboratory, uh, which does a lot of outer space work, as you probably know. Uh, the, for instance, the New Horizons mission to Pluto, that's from APL, the applied physics lab. So we sit between those three. Our objective is to develop technology that protects uh, people. Uh, our tagline is protecting people, structures, and the planet. We're really interested in extreme events. So those kinds of events that most people try to um, avoid looking at, uh, we are particularly interested in those because that's where we see the really exciting uh, behaviors of materials that most people will avoid. So um, you get extremely high pressures, extremely high temperatures, very short time scales. Those are the fun things for us. Along with other scientists, you took on the question of how much energy does it take to actually destroy an asteroid and break it into pieces? Tell us about the computer model that you developed. Sure. So um, I should back up a little bit on this. So, so we were interested in what it takes to disrupt an asteroid. And it turns out disrupting an asteroid actually has two parts to it. Uh, you, you may want to break the asteroid, but then the question is, does it stay broken or does gravity pull it back together? Our first objective was to understand the disrupt, the, the breaking part. How does it break? And to understand that, we really had to understand how the rocks that make up an asteroid break. So we built a model first for understanding how rocks break, and then we scaled that up to look at how an asteroid would break. So the computational model, uh, it's kind of an interesting problem. If you think about how a rock breaks, right? So it's fracture, it's a crack that propagates through the rock. The question is, where does the crack start? And usually you think about the crack as starting from some kind of a flaw inside the rock. So the rock has a hole in it somewhere that starts a crack, that's how it breaks. The problem is when you start talking about breaking a rock very fast, then the mechanics changes, the way in which the fracture process develops changes. Because now the question is not how fast does a crack grow, that's one of the questions, but how many cracks do you have? And how fast do those grow? And do they talk to each other? So think about it this way. If I take a piece of something and try to stretch it to break it, right? If I do it slowly, imagine I have a piece of um, a, a ceramic plate and I pull on it and I stretch it and I do it slowly, it'll break into two pieces. And the place where it'll break is the biggest flaw, the biggest defect in the plate. This is why when you go out and you buy ceramic plates, the company works really hard to have no defects in it, no big defects, so it doesn't break easily. But if I take the same thing and pull on it really fast, then you'll find it breaks into many hundreds of pieces. And that's because a crack will still grow from the biggest defect, but before the crack can break the whole plate, another crack will start from the next defect and then the next one down. So it turns out breaking something fast is very different from breaking something slowly. And that's what happens with rocks. So to break a rock dynamically is much harder than breaking it with slow loading. And that then is the problem for asteroids because asteroids are very, very big rocks, are very big collections of rocks. So this time scale really matters. And that's what we were trying to do with our computational model was understand how the fracture will propagate across the rocks. Isn't one of the hazards, though, by breaking up an asteroid that we might turn one threat into a group of threats? It is, absolutely. Uh, it's actually a really important hazard. So um, if you think about what an asteroid might do to the Earth, right? Um, you, you've got to break this down to two or three different classes of problems. If the, if the asteroid is really small, you know, the size of my laptop, it's just going to burn up in the atmosphere. Nothing to worry about, really. You see a nice flash, you see a meteor, you're happy. Um, it gets a little bigger, gets to the size of my room, um, it probably will explode in the atmosphere. You'll get an airburst of some sort. That could cause a shock wave, a blast wave. Those can cause some damage. But it probably doesn't reach the ground. If it gets to a much larger size, a big room, you know, the size of my, the, the hall or one floor of the building, now that thing is going to reach the ground. Uh, 
it might break a little bit in the atmosphere, but parts of it will definitely reach the ground. And if you get big enough, then you'll actually couple into the ground and you'll create a big crater and you'll throw material back up into the air. So depending on the size scale, you can sort of think of it as asteroids that are less than 100 meters, between 100 meters and a kilometer and bigger than a kilometer in size, those kinds of scales. The dangerous thing for us is the big ones, right? That, that's what we are used to thinking about, uh, like the asteroid that probably killed the dinosaurs. Really big one impacts. It hits the Earth. It throws out a lot of ejector. The ejector comes back into the atmosphere, and that causes a lot of damage. It's both the direct impact and the coupling into the atmosphere that causes damage. Now, if you take an asteroid and break it into pieces, you might be hoping that none of the pieces will hit the ground. And in principle, if you break it into dust, you're probably right. But what's going to happen is you're going to take all of that energy and all of that chemistry and couple it into the atmosphere. And generally, the atmosphere is what humans are most sensitive to. You know, we sit on the skin of the planet, right? So we are exposed primarily to what the atmosphere does. You change the atmosphere and we don't like it. So humanity is much more susceptible to big changes in the atmosphere than anything else. So that's the big danger. You can break it up into small pieces, but you start damaging the atmosphere. If we choose to disrupt it or destroy it, to what degree does the asteroid's composition affect the impact and how precise do our measurements need to be for that yeah. composition to, to have be, to be? You know, this, this is a really good question and we don't have a really good answer. So, so the fact is the asteroid's composition does matter. Uh, it's, it's two sides, the composition and how tightly packed it is. So if it's made mostly of a metal, an iron or something, it'll have one kind of behavior. If it's made mostly of um, very puffy kinds of dust, you know, like volcanic ash stuck together, it'll have a different kind of behavior. They'll disrupt differently, meaning it's, harder to, it's actually harder to break the puffball than it is to break the, the, the solid body. So it's a puffball, you put something up and just goes squish and then comes back. Uh, whereas the, the issue, um, with the composition, meaning what it's made of, not just how it's put together, is the chemistry shows up there, right? We don't have a really good idea of what the ranges of compositions are out there. We have some idea, because we can see the surface of the asteroid, we can see the spectrum of the asteroid, right? You watch the asteroid, you look at the light, you have a sense of the wavelengths, you know the colors, and we can say something from that about composition. But we don't really know what's inside the asteroids. And that's where most of the mass is. And so we are in the place where we guess at what's in the asteroids. We think we have fairly good guesses, but we really need samples of those asteroids to come back to Earth so that we can then estimate. Now we argue right now that we have some of those samples, we call them meteorites, so we have those pieces. We have some data from there. That's basically how we are doing it right now. We're taking the meteorites, understanding behavior from the meteorite, we know something about the moon, we have some moon rock, we understand behavior from that. So we're using those to estimate what happens when an asteroid comes in. But with any real asteroid coming in that's significant in size, we really have to worry about what it's made of. And the, right now, the range of uncertainty from our comp computer models is quite big. Without having pieces of a, an asteroid brought back, it's much harder to get a sense what it'll be like. Now, the danger is when we pick up the meteorites, maybe only certain meteorites actually get to the ground, right? So some kinds of asteroids might be coming in and the meteorites may not be good samples of those. What role does advanced notice time play in disruption or deflection planning? That's a big thing. It's a, it's a really large fraction of the time. So the fact is most of the time, we, if it's a big asteroid, big enough to cause significant damage to us, we cannot disrupt it. We don't have enough energy to disrupt these things. So most of the time, de deflection is our strategy of choice. But deflection, if you want to move something big, you have, again, have to provide it with a lot of momentum because it's moving in one direction, you want to move in a different direction. We call that a delta V, a change of the velocity. And if you know the mass and the change of velocity you want, that's the change of momentum you want. And if you want to move something big, that's a lot of momentum. It's really hard to deliver a lot of momentum. So ideally, you want to move it just a little bit and still cause it to miss. But if you want to do that, you have to move it a long time before it hits. 
so that you can move it well ahead of when it's likely to have an impact. So even a small change in the orbit will cause it a mess. So deflection time is key, which partly also means that observation time is key. When do we know it's coming, right? So if we only observe it five days before it's going to come in, we really don't have enough time to deflect. If we observe it five years before it's going to come in, now we have a shot. If it's 50 years, we probably can do something. Interesting. K.T. Ramesh, Director, Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. If somebody wants to connect with you, uh, Mr. Ramesh, how can they do that? Easiest way is to come to my website. It's hemi.jhu.edu. And then from there, you can come to my page. That's the easiest way to do it. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.